This is our private DMs, okay? Tanner sends his video at 8.51, okay? This is a 10-minute video. He sends it at 8.51. I just want you guys to do the math here. 8.53, Fundamentals of Investing Podcast says, well done on this vid. Very <laughs> crucial info. Okay? And then Tanner could have let it go. Honestly, I would have let it go. I didn't care that much. Yeah, he's um, watching on 5x speed. And then Tanner decides to clap back. He says, did you watch it all? Bro, I just posted. I have to literally get on Twitter to be like, LMFAO, nah, this is how the pod is going to start. Because I think the SoFi community deserves to see the the unbelievableness of what Tevis did. And Tanner said, how so? I said, because no way Tevis watched it. So him saying great vid is hilarious. In two minutes, this guy watched a nine minute video. First of all, let's go to Tanner. Tanner, when you saw this, before you hear Tevis's defense, how did you feel when this happened? Let down, disrespected disregarded my feelings, my video, my hard work. Riley, what are your thoughts before Tevis goes on? Outraged and appalled. For a 10 minute Tanner video, it takes me like 30 or 40 minutes to get through it. So just knowing Tevis uh, got through it within two minutes is kind of unbelievable. You know that it is possible to be supportive without actually watching the full video. No, no, right? no, no. Like, this is not a, this is not a debate like, about support. This is just a debate about lying. It's not a debate about I support. didn't lie. I said it's very crucial lying. info. I didn't but say did, I did watched. You didn't get any info from the thumbnail and title? That's what gave you the info? What is the like? Dude, I was like halfway through the video. There you First, go. I'm your biggest fan. There you go. First to respond, first to like it, first to watch it. it That's great. But then when you said very well done vid. Mofo, if you go back into our DMs and you see what I responded, I said, haha, I'm halfway through right now. You know, I would have been like, great thumbnail. I'm going to watch this in a little bit. But but you just said very well done vid. To me, I'm like, wait a second. That means the vid has been completed in terms of watch time. But it it was well done. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I just love watching him square. This, this is great. Is this is bickering. bickering. Like, Bro, I, I left high there. school a long time ago. Enough of this shit. In the video, I said that you needed 10,854 shares uh, at a price of $5.74. This was to get to a million dollars in, in the stock price. And the reason why was to show off that I believe that the stock is going to go up by 32% on a compounded annual growth rate for the next 10 years. Very aggressive. I don't even believe that this is a total best case scenario. I think that this is a, a bullish case for sure, but not best case. They would have to not grow at the level you think they're going to grow. There would have to be some fuck up. So let's talk about this merger. Are they overspending well, on this merger, right? That would definitely not be the best thing to, to play into your uh, your case. It's 16 next in 10 years to, for SoFi to be like, what, $92, I think you said, Tanner? $93? Right. Yeah, I mean, like a 16X sounds kind of crazy, but it doesn't from five bucks because they were expected, one could argue they could have 10X from the $10 spec price. Galileo, I think, has to play a big role into that. The consumer growth has to happen in terms of personal banking, and there actually has to be this revolution about getting your money right. And if that happens, then yeah, I think it's a so, reasonable video. I think a 16X, I like looking at it as a 32% compounded annual growth rate. That's extremely aggressive. Yes, right? That's that expecting is. a higher growth rate and for longer period of time than what Palantir is expecting. The stock price is actually under a one times price to book ratio, meaning that if we were to just go back to a two times price to earnings ratio, 2x price to book, which is completely normal. In, in the fintech space, like, like I even showed off, even now the average is 6.2 times. Just to go to two times would mean that we only need to do about 16% compounded annual growth rates. It would cut it in half. So half of that growth to actually get to the stock price would just be in a change in valuation in this stock, which obviously could happen considering how much we've decreased in value since November of, of 2021. I mean, look, man, it's all execution risk, right? Like after the consolidation of the course in 2025, but if we have another bull run 24, 25, then that's obviously going to inflate the multiple that SoFi will command. They're going to be in a profitable position. They're going to have consolidated their cores. By that time, probably we'll have some big bank clients on Galileo's network announced and public. Yeah, I don't think it's unrealistic to expect. Like 10 years is a long time, man. What I also wanted to touch on, my actual valuation of you know a 16x over the next 10 years versus what Anthony Noto thinks that this stock will do in the next three to five years. Last fireside chat, he believed that we would become a top 10 financial institution by assets under management. We have like $9 billion as of the last recorded Fed numbers, which places us at 149. He thinks in the next three to five years, we'll go from 9 billion to what it stands today, which it'll probably grow, 300 in $87 billion. People think wow. my estimates are bullish. We're not even close. I mean, if the CEO is saying, hey, this is what we're going to do, and we trust him as an operator, 
with these types of things, like you have to take a spoonful of salt, right? Because like I said, it's execution risk. You have to take it in turns. What are the next catalysts? Like what are the next things that I'm looking for? It's consolidation of the cores, obviously them hitting their tranches by 2026, 2025. If we hit their tranches, they're consolidated, they're profitable. And then we can start to look to other targets. But I think, you know, we have to hit these mile markers before we can even start to consider because the milestones that we hit, <clears throat> whether we hit them early or late in the next two years or in the next three years are going to dictate what the stock is going to do in the next 10 years. You, you can't value so far on what it is today based on the technology that it will develop within the next five to 10 years. Banking apps suck. And I, I really think that uh, so far will get a lot of deposits. But I don't think there's any way you can actually really value how SoFi is going to look in 10 years. There is an interesting, I think, nuance. And just building on what Riley said, when you invest in these innovative companies, there is always a portion of that investment that is the call option on the future ideas or products that the company can come up with in the future because they are innovative companies. And so it is a byproduct or a feature of an innovative company. Let's say I invest in SoFi today. I am also investing in the potential future products that they're going to come out with. Two years ago, I don't think anybody would have expected SoFi to have a buy now, pay later product or a lot of the products that they've rolled out. Two years from now, they will be rolling out other products that maybe are not on our radar at all. AI is very buzzwordy right now. That could be a potential direction. And so the point is that there are the things that we can measure and extrapolate from that to say, okay, here's the demographics, here's the growth rates. And then there is that unknown factor. Like we don't know what the actual products are. We know that there is going to be innovative products in the future because it is an innovative company. Dude, in five to 10 years, we could see something completely different than what we see now. So if I could be doing a social network, they could be, taking on different types of like products, like sending money around the world, which is something that banks don't do inside their app at all. There's so many ways to make money in this space, putting it all under one house is just going to make it more sticky than any other app or product out there. So the CEOs don't usually make these crazy and bold predictions because it can cost them their career, right? I think usually they try to stay on the more conservative side and then actually outperform whenever it comes to the fundamentals. I don't think Noto would be dumb enough to say something so crazy that might force investors to rethink his ability to project the company going forward. Because right now I feel like he's doing an amazing job and he has the full support of, of all of his uh, investors. That might change. Are you, are you worried about that actually happening? Yeah. I mean, do I think that there, this is going to be a top 10 financial institution in the next three to five years? I don't see a road to that even 1%. Yeah. You, you know, you never know what happens with the macro. I mean, we saw some crazy stuff happen in 2021. If we have another thing like that, I mean, it Tesla also, went to a trillion. It also depends on how he's measuring it. He's definitely not measuring it by market cap. He's probably measuring it by like deposits or something. Assets under management. Starting tomorrow, registration is starting for all banks in the US to register for FedNow access, uh, which should be coming later this June and July, which will be the first time where banks federally can and send money instantaneously. This alone is just going to change the way that America does business. Technologies are going to be built off of it or technologies are going to synergize with it. <laughs> if you have instantaneous movement of money, how, how easy is it? going to be to leave your old bank and go to SoFi. Yeah, but everybody's going to have access to like all the financial institutions are going to have access to Fed now, right? So it's yep. not really, and, it's and not businesses. Like a, it's not a um, moat for SoFi. It's not a moat, but it, it does increase competition. It actually reduces a ton of scams as well, because uh, a lot of banks will front you the money before it's actually deposited in. And then scammers like to say, okay, we'll, we'll send that money over to somebody else. And then the check comes and it doesn't clear and, and you're left holding the bag. This is going to really increase the speed of money transfers, but will this help people know the name of SoFi as a brand? I don't know. Think of the Silicon Valley Bank, if it, if FedNow was uh, available. What would a bank run look like if all payments were instantaneous? Would a bank be able to handle that risk? Because usually they have like a buffer zone of like when deposits and everything are going out. Maybe these big banks aren't ready for this this big change as much as say SoFi is. Maybe SoFi will be able to actually utilize this technology faster than these big banks because there's too much risk allowing their users to send money instantaneously. I don't think we should conflate instantaneous payments with liquidity issues because that was fundamentally a liquidity issue from the bank. It was not necessarily like individuals were getting stuck in sending payments back and forth. So I think that like FedNow is really good from a quality of life utility perspective for the end consumer, but 
I don't know how much it's going to actually like revitalize the entire banking industry and, and make it a perfect competition. Sure, it's a step in the right direction, I guess. It's it's a nice to have. It's not like a, a game changer, in my opinion. News broke uh, this week on Wednesday, I believe it is, due to some research from several members in the community, but Bender posted about this on Reddit, around SoFi acquiring a top-rated mortgage lender and servicer. We've been talking about this on this podcast after the Q4 earnings. Uh, I basically said, SoFi having found a new partner for home loans, that partner would be a prime acquisition target. And so it seems as though SoFi has gone ahead with that move. Terms of that deal are not disclosed yet. Uh, an official announcement is expected from SoFi. Of course, the make or break factor of this is going to be the terms of the deal. I initially took this as, you know, just unsubstantiated rumors, but we actually got to the articles of merger. But yeah, so basically SoFi uh, acquired this other company, Wyndham Capital, basically this 20, 30 year old mortgage company. They have about 19 and a half thousand loans funded in 2021, $6.5 billion in loan volume in 2021. The way it differentiates itself based basically on their website is that they, they do a lot of automations. So they use something called RPAs, which are robotic process automations. And what they claim is that they can do twice as amount of loans per full-time employee than the rest of the industry, eliminating delays. They eliminated 1.5 million clicks. Uh, eliminated through their way of doing things, 2.7 million robotic processes performed monthly, 4,000 employee hours saved per month uh, via robotic processes. So every financial institution out there has some baseline process. The problem is a lot of them are bogged down by legacy infrastructure. They're bogged down by redundancies. They're bogged down by red tape and so on and so forth. But I, I do think that the automation point, while it's good, I don't think is like the key here on a macro point. What this signals is really strong. I, I said last week in the SoFi Weekly podcast that SoFi raising their savings APY to 4%, SoFi increasing their FDIC insurance to 2 million, Noto buying shares hand over fist, all of these were signaling strength in a time of weak macro economics, like with uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic Bank, Credit Suisse, all of these banks left and right seeming to wobble. SoFi is taking advantage of that. Literally, guys, two weeks ago, the main concern was whether SoFi is going to have a bank run. Two weeks later, they're out here acquiring other companies on the cheap. I think Kyle brought up speculation on as to how much could they have paid for this, saying that Technosys was uh, like 1 billion, Galileo was 1.2 billion, and he was thinking that this would be 500 to one. 500 million to 1 billion. I actually think that uh, in this macroeconomic time that we're in, two to three price to sales ratio is my ballpark or where I'd be, 100 to 200 million max. But the wider point to take away is that SoFi is making big moves. They're moves that you would expect the winners of the space to be making when you're thinking of consolidation in that banking space. I personally disagree. The numbers that, that Kyle gave, I actually don't think he was crazy on. He was projecting the the first numbers that came out was $180 million in revenue, which places his $500 million bet. Not crazy. I think it'll be a five to six times price to sales. And the reason is, is that we're not thriving. Our home loan sector is dying. It's, it's without this acquisition, it would probably hit near zero in terms of new originations. We've been very open about the idea that we need to go out and acquire something. I don't think that this is a blood in the streets sort of idea. So we're speculating on the revenue. I've seen 40 million. I've seen 80 million. I've seen 180 million. My bet would be that it's probably five to six X. First of all, we don't really have an accurate view of what the revenue is. The numbers that have been found online have been, I think, 40, 80, and then 180. Depending on the multiple you give, like if you say 5X. Five to six. 5X times four, that's 200 million versus 180 million you know, times five, that's like almost a billion, right? Like, so there, there's like a huge range there depending on what the revenue number is. But I just think that five to six in a market where tech companies has, have fallen 80%, like those are multiples that I would expect, you know, other companies that are not profitable, uh, companies that have been hurt from 2022, that have fallen maybe 80% and that have liquidity issues that have maybe a limited runway, but they have innovative technology. That's where I would put maybe a 5X multiple or a 6X multiple. But this company that doesn't really seem to have any significant redeeming qualities from a technology perspective, that's why I was How putting it as two that? to three. There, there's nothing that's, we're buying them for their sure, tech. But I understand, but there's like mortgage companies left and right. They're not a mortgage company. They're a tech company. I don't think so. 
But because like, okay, what makes them a tech company? Man, every single yeah. mortgage company out there has some technology in their process. It doesn't make them a tech company. Anyone can write mortgages. We could be a private lender and and completely sign mortgages to anyone that wants them. Sure. As long as that we actually risk out the deal. Why would we spend money to acquire someone else that has less clientele than us? Like, why are we buying them? Why are we so hurting for a partner other than their technology? This is a tech company. So a few things I know about the company from reading is they worked on their technology for six years. They don't give any information on how they use data-driven insights. They do talk heavily about their RPAs, which is robotic process automations. That is something that's not exclusive to this company, Winham Capital. Uh, a ton of other mortgage lenders use it. Uh, basically, it's like if I'm on a phone call with a customer that wants to take out a mortgage, they, they call me, I enter in all their information. And then whenever I enter in all their information, I press go and then all the robots, software robots on my computer will go and fill out all the necessary applications for the specific user on my desktop while I just sit down and do nothing. There's two options. Either they're buying this from a position of weakness or from a position of strength. They had 18 months to pick a new partner. There's more than one. I mean, mortgages are not necessarily an oligopoly out there, right? Especially in, in America, it's there's lots of different mortgage providers. And we're coming off of a time in 2022 when mortgages as a whole have been absolutely decimated. Rates are mm -hmm. sky high, right? Mortgage businesses are hurting. And so if I think about that, well, 18 months plus SoFi is in a position where they have cash on hand. They have their pick of the litter, let's say, on mortgage players. What, like, to me, that signals that they're coming from a position of strength, that they have purchasing power, that they have leverage to lower that multiple because of where the macro is. And so that's where I'm coming from. When I checked out this company, I was like, well, that, you know, that's great, the RPD process. But it's not like, like a Lemonade, for example, is a company that their entire DNA is weaving AI and data-driven decisions into their process. Wyndham Capital is like a mortgage provider first, tech company second. And there is but, speculation that they fired 500 people in the last six months. Um, yeah, they probably didn't that do is, that out of fun. Like they're probably hurting just like everybody else. But that no, is speculation, I, 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 there's not proof just saying that. I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure that, that that could be a thing, but I think there's a difference between looking at like a lemonade, for example, on public markets, what people are actually valuing this company today and what a company, a single individual could go in and buy the entire company for. But I've seen that example brought up a bunch of times now, Lemonade, and how cheap their valuation is and how tech forward they are. But no one's buying that full company for that price. Uh, it, it wouldn't happen. It would probably, like, I would venture to say it would probably be more than 5x or even 10x what it's valued at today if you were to buy it out in one shot. And, and these types of multiples are not unheard of. Like if the tech is there, which I think it's there for, we're not buying it for their, uh, you know, we're not buying Wyndham for their client base. We're buying it for their tech. And, and I know that you guys want to say that this, this technology is similar to other players, but Wyndham is coming up as the number one ranked, you know, mortgage things. You guys all saw the, the same things in the same chats that we're in. How is that possible that they're being ranked higher than lower.com and all of these other people that are using the same processes? How is it possible that they're getting the cuts on their industry standards? They're obviously doing things that whether they're you know proprietary for, for their business or they just do it better because of a company culture, SoFi wants them specifically. And we've just been extremely public about buying a company. I don't think that's from a place of space. I think that's from a place of this industry of, of, our, of our sector is literally dying. Mm. It, it, it's going to zero. And so we need to pick someone up. Nothing in SoFi's history says that we're bargain hunters. What, we, what's your number then, Tanner? Like what's your, what's your like, range like five, i said well i don't know how much they make so that's impo it's impossible chris, for me to get so i'm saying chris five to says he would be comfortable with anything under 300 million cash position as well like 1.2 something like that yeah like 1.2 that's where chris Hager's right number there. is coming from it's a percentage of our total cash because like if they uh, blew if they blew their entire cash position on this one deal then it's like extra risk you add right yeah for SoFi, if you look at their Glassdoor reviews, they're the out of all of the job offerings, the worst rated job offering at SoFi is loan originators, people that pick up phones and talk to people and have to enter in data because there it's just a lot of work they have to do. So th these RPAs, if they are actually better than like industry standard, maybe they are looking towards that because they want to expand their loan originations. Because if if that tech will allow them to double 
their loan originations, that would be actually kind of crazy because they are receiving a, a lot of deposits now, you know. Sorry, Tevis, just really quick, just to give you some credit. You could be right in the fact that if this tech is is as useless as, as, as the research is showing, it could be that this was such a cheap acquisition that it was cheaper than to just build out our own tech. And in that case, mm. I will be wrong. I think also Noto will go after a certain company, I think, if he really, really likes management. I believe that he's a big fan of Derek White and Miguel, and I think that's a big part of his strategy as well. Chris is here if y'all want to invite him on for a quick take before we go. Chris, was this a good move or not a good move? Ultimately, it depends on what you guys are talking about, which is how much we pay for him. I think that long term, it's a great move because eventually the mortgage, when mortgages come back, right, then we'll have the tech already ready to go. It's kind of like the S-curve that he talked about in the last conference, right, where he talked about how we spent the last two years three years getting our credit card offering right. And now we're ready to finally scale it. I think it's the same thing with mortgages. They're going to spend the next year or two getting it so that it's really dialed in so that they can hit the accelerator. So I think that number one. Number two, I think that that $180 million revenue is probably at the peak. I think that's in 2021. Originations, if you look at like UWMC and Rocket Mortgage and Loan Depot and, and, and just across the industry, they're down about 50 to 60% in terms of originations. And they're not getting higher revenues per originations than they were previously. Because we don't know the revenue numbers, I looked at originations. They're benchmarked public companies, so those three, Rocket, United Wholesale Mar Mortgage, and then Loan Depot. Rocket mortgage gets the highest in terms of valuation. So how much they, their market cap per origination, if you think of it as like a price per origination, they get much higher than any of the other two. But even if you assume that Wyndham Capital has lost about 50% of their origination, so they were at 6.5 billion originations in 2021, and it's probably come down. So it's in the low three billions. And if you look at those numbers, you're looking at something like about a $430 million acquisition if you give them the same valuation per origination as Rocket Mortgage has. When I looked at Kyle White's number from 500 to 1.5 billion, I just don't see it. I would guess their their actual revenue, again, based on kind of what these other three companies get in terms of like revenue per, per origination, their revenue is at a maximum, probably like 150 million. And that's being really, really generous, I think. None of us are trying to speculate on the actual revenue because I don't think we, like you said, we don't know if that's peak or, or current or whatever. Yeah, we're just talking multiples. Yeah, what, what do you think on a price to sales multiple of what we pay I don't for? Think that, that I think is maybe better. So, I mean, if you look at, again, those other big originators, like again, Rocket has the best price per sales and their price per sales is 2.2. I can't imagine us paying more than four. UWMC, their price per sales is 1.1 and Loan Depot is 0.15. Now, Loan Depot is burning a lot of cash, right? They're distressed. Like they've got negative earnings and they had positive earnings in, in 2021, but in 2022, they're, they've lost a lot of money. Wyndham has laid off over 50% of their workforce. At some point, they had 700 plus employees and now they've only got, according to their website, and now they've only got 350. So they're not killing it. The CEO is the person who founded the company back in 2001. Chris, um, you think all cash? I think all cash. I would yeah, be disappointed too. if it was dilution or mostly cash and maybe a little bit of stock. But if, if it's all stock, I will dislike this deal regardless because I think that SoFi right now is super undervalued. And why yeah. would you use stock to pay for a deal when you yourself think that your stock isn't worth what it should be? Yeah. Odo obviously doesn't think the stock is worth what it should be because he's buying a bunch of it, right? They could be using that cash for other things, right? They could be using it to collateralize the loans. But instead, they've been building up their cash reserves. My opinion on that is that they've been doing that because they are ready to acquire something. They want to be able to have the flexibility to do these types of acquisitions and they want to be able to do them in cash. I think that's why we have 1.4 billion in cash. I could be wrong. This is just my Chris, opinion. why did we buy this company? Is it for the tech? I think that the tech is forward thinking, especially in a distressed environment. It's easy to, to acquire things like this. Like Ally did the same thing. When Ally was growing, they did a lot of these kind of small acquisitions and merge. Well, they weren't mergers, they were acquisitions, which this is too, right? And they acquired all these kind of small thing, niche companies that did something really well. And then they took that and they they made a bigger company out of it. I think SoFi is in the same vein. In some ways, that's kind of scary because you, you'd rather have organic growth rather than acquisition growth because that is more difficult. It's interesting, Chris, that you brought up the the fluctuation in headcount or layoffs, I guess, put another way, because I know in the the original Reddit post, Bender was speculating as to an aqua hiring, which is essentially when 
a company acquires another company primarily for its talent rather than anything else. I can't imagine it being a, a great morale in that place if such a large portion was let go. So prob probably defeats that thesis, if that's the case. A lot of it is segmented. Like they have offices in different places. Like they'll have a place in Dallas, a place in another place. So some it might not affect morale as much as we think. This is the articles of the merger. Yeah, so all I was going to say on this was that uh, it sort of formalized this move. This was articles were filed earlier yesterday. Now, zoom in on that signature event. Chad Borton's signature is on here. He's the president. I can tell you why that is. Yeah, please do so. So this was filed in North Carolina. Uh, and in North can Carolina, you explain who Chad Borton is? So he's the president of SoFi Bank. So the reason why is because this was filed in North Carolina. And in North Carolina, the active SoFi, their, their business is SoFi Lending, the one that, that they've like registered with the Secretary of State. And the person who's who's in charge of SoFi Lending is Chad Borton, according to their like their filings. On the articles of merger, that one document, it said April 3rd, 2023, is going to be the effective date of those articles, which is Monday. In other words, SoFi is going to officially announce on Monday. So this is what the website was th that morning. It looked like this. The interesting thing is we actually saw in real time that it went to this. All of a sudden it turned SoFi blue. Oh, wow. And if you zoom in on the bottom, but it still had the Wyndham Capital logo. It had, so it had the Wyndham logo, but it also had this SoFi Bank link and the NMLS changed to SoFi's. And then like five minutes later, it changed over to this one that had the SoFi logo. If they're making coach agents on a live environment like that, I am going to go out on a limb and question their tech right now, Riley. <laughs> I think it was a mistake because they took yeah. down the link that the, the apply button is gone from their website now that linked to that page. The SoFi community is too quick. Bender even realized even as this transition was happening that we recently just switched over to that, uh, you, you saw it there, Blend which is, I guess, the the new tech that we're using. They realized that that switched over, I think about a month ago or something. So this this acquisition was sort of in talks, I guess, for a while now. So Chris, sure. overall, you think this was, as my camera dies, you think overall this was a good deal. It obviously depends how much we pay for it, but you are bullish on this happening. You think Noto's moving in the right direction. With, this with that caveat, yes. Like if it comes out and it's 500 million and it's stock, I will be very upset. If it's all cash and it's under 300 million, I think the over under is right around 300 million. And if it's under that, I'd feel pretty good about that. You think this acquisition will affect when we go profit or maybe push it back a quarter, but good in the long term. So I actually had the opposite speculation that if they can get their ducks in a row faster, then that could mean SoFi putting more money behind promoting uh, home loans towards the second half of the year. And actually that could be a tailwind for profitability because student or home loans wasn't really very much accounted for as a revenue driver in 2023. A lot of the accounting issues, like if we did use stock or something like this, and then having to put that on the expenses for the year. And so he's saying that, uh, by the way, that the year is not going to be positive by Q4. It's the quarter that will be gap profitable. In that case, if this happens now, I, I, I wouldn't see how it would affect it. I think it'll be accretive. As far as I can tell, they've never had a funding round. I think it's pretty much wholly owned by the founder and whatever stock options he's given to his employees, which makes me think that they've probably been profitable or at least cash flow positive if they haven't had to, you know, raise any funding. Um, so I think it's probably EBIT, uh, at least positive, probably gap positive, positive, positive but I don't know. All right, guys. Yeah, we're out. Yeah, we See you guys next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.